Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on responsible food consumption and production. I'm happy to see so much and uh, of your um, with interest in our session and I wish to express my warmest welcome to all people on site and remotely around the world. My name is Ina Opitz. I'm affiliated with the Museum of Natural History in Berlin and together with Annette Richter, um, we co-sharing the session today. Um, Annette is not in the session already, but I hope she will come during the next seconds or minutes. So um, she or I, I, I am going to guide you through the first part of the session. I will start with a short introduction of our presenters, followed by a short keynote by Annette to set the scene before we are going to hear the four presenta five presentations in the format of speed talks of five minutes each. And in the second half, I will lead the discussion round and will wrap the, uh, the session with a short conclusion. Um, now it is my greatest pleasure to introduce you to the fantastic speakers and presenters of today. I'm very pleased to introduce you um, the early career scientist Jessica Lucinda Ambraco from the University of Kassel, who are going to present uh, her project, The Impact of Citizen Science Towards Sustainable Production of Aromatic Plants. Um, I'm very much looking forward to hear more about this topic and the great locations you are planning to perform this project. Very welcome. Uh, further, we will hear from Rachel Pateman about her current citizen science project on food losses and waste. Rachel is from the University of York and affiliated with Stockholm Environmental Institute. She works as a researcher and investigates the process in, processes in citizen science as well as looking into how the best design citizen science to make maximize data quality. Hello, Rachel, welcome. Um, following this talk, Siri uh, granum Kasson will present her research on citizen science engagement and biotechnology innovation, the need for research and the role of ethics. Siri is director of the NTNU Oceans at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the Faculty of Humanities at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Siri, hello. Uh, next in the line will be Danielle Wild. Um, we are, are going to provide us with brain food with her presentation on rethinking food, empowering citizens in societal change processes. Danielle is associate professor from the University of Southern Denmark at the Department of Design and Communication. Danielle is highly specialized in participatory design, design research focused on social and ecological sustainability. I'm very much looking forward to hear more about the project of empowering. Hello, Danielle. And finally, uh, we are pleased to have Frederick Brunius from the initiative Consupedia on behalf of Roberto Rufus Gonzalez here. Um, I think both are re researching sustainable behavioral changes, focusing on sustainable dishes in Swedish schools. Um, hello, Frederick. Nice to, to have you here. Um, to all the presenters, thank you for taking part of the session and wonderful to have you on board. Thank you. Um, before we jump right into the topic, I wish to briefly introduce you the tool, the online platform we are using today. 
uh, while testing the tool, we observed some cha challenges, challenges with the platform. First, enlarge your screen as much as possible to see the presentation. Use, for example, the control plus function uh, and double click uh, the presentation. Secondly, we wish to encourage you to use the chat for sharing your knowledge about your projects, um, for resources uh, you wish to share. And thirdly, after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session. Um, please keep your questions until the end of the presentation, otherwise they might get lost in the conversation. Um, we will start with a Q&A session right after the presentation and give you a hint if you can use the chat function. Um, and finally, um, we share here this address with you. You can use it to get uh, in contact with us and if you want to uh, have the posters of the presenters emailed, uh, you can get in contact with, with us due to this um, email address, agrifoodexa at gmail.com. Um, yeah, you can use it. Okay, I see Annette now entered the room and I hope she will be able to give her keynote now. I, I would like to wait some seconds. Um, hello, Annette. Okay. We see you. And I started with the introduction and it's you are on time uh, to give you our keynote. Yes, thank you very much and sorry for all this trouble. I'm trying to go as long as possible with the connection. Um, I have experienced, uh, I experienced some difficulties. Yes, so next slide, please, Ina. So yes, welcome to the session and um, I'm pleased uh, to give you a short little keynote uh, to pick you up and to set the scene. So I would like to start with this quotation you see on the left hand side, which says food connects to all SDGs, which is a quotation from Johan Rekström. He is the director of the Swedish Resilience Center. And he said this quotation at the keynote speech um, about his views on the SDGs in relation to food. So in his talk, and uh, I will provide the link to this talk afterwards, he uh, provides a very good example how these SDGs are all linked together on the example of food. So what he does and his colleague, they place the food in the center of uh, this SDG uh, icons, and then they place around this object, the food, all the others. And they provide evidence about how this is connected and interlinked. And when they performed this exercise together, uh, they came up with this so-called wedding cake. And what you can mm -hmm. see basically with this wedding cake is that the basement of all of this. Mm -hmm. Ina, we cannot hear you. I think actually she went out of the yes, room. Yes, but we okay, can't hear Ina. Too bad now that we're I, just getting. I, I was muted. I was uh -huh. muted um, because I had uh, the hope that uh, I my my task the next minutes is only to click uh, the next slide. So, um, but I try my best um, to uh, go for. Uh, uh, father with the presentation. Annette spoke about uh, the wedding cake that is shown in the picture. Um, from the arrangement, it becomes clear that in particular economies and societies are embedded parts of the biosphere and the biosphere is providing the basement of all other connections. When Annette uh, first came across the figure, uh, it struck her as this figure represents a new model and a new way of thinking about the SDGs. It mainly, it mainly implies moving away from the still established, established sectoral approach of sustainability where social, economic and ecological development are seen as separated parts, hardly connected, interlinked, sometimes even conflictual. 
um, we all know that food is an important factor for our physical and psychological health. There is a big gap of knowledge about the impact some food production processes and consumption patterns of the environment or on other people's life. With this new view provided by Johann Rockström, the interconnectedness of the SDGs in relation to the food system, it becomes clear that economy serves society and not vice versa. And this is Annette's idea on her uh, a very interesting twist of the logic made visible through the linkages of SDGs and this, uh, this case food. In this context of food production and consumption and sustainability, the question that is being often raised is how can we feed the world's current and future population in a sustainable way? In the study by Springman et al. from 2018, published in Nature, several options for keeping the food system with environmental limits are provided and explained. Overall, the study concludes that it is indeed possible to feed 10 billion people by 2050 within planetary limits under the requirements of certain rigorous actions that include that would be first a global shift toward healthy and more plant-based diets, second halving food loss and waste and th uh, third improving farming practices and technologies. In their paper Springman acknowledge some already existing initiatives and attempts to implement these actions. However, in order to have a real impact, they call for two important actions. The first is rapid upscale and the second is global coordination of these initiatives. At the end of the paper, some uncertainties of the analysis is presented. They did not assess the impact that climate change could have on crop yields and freshwater av availability. That was kind of a shock to me, to Annette, when she was reading the paper again in 2019. Because in 2019, in Nature Sustainability, work, work by Richard Cottrell and colleagues on food production shocks, shocks across land and sea was published and Annette read it. The authors identified, it identified 226 food production shocks across 134 nations between 1961 and 2013. The main conclusion was the increasing frequency of shocks across all the sectors on a global side. You can this see here on the slide. Um, in this presented figure from the paper, you see drivers of food production shocks indicated in the different colors for the sectors of crop, livestock, fisheries and aquaculture. This figures, figure tells us um, the extreme weather shown in red was a major cause of shocks to crops and livestock, in the first column. The drivers of production shocks vary between sector, mostly crop production shocks were driven by climate or weather events, while mismanagement, such as overfishing, contributed to many fishery production shocks. It's here in the third line column. For livestock, 31% of shocks were due to geopolitical factors such as conflict in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. Um, but what are the consequences of this? finding. First, the planetary boundaries might be much more narrower, narrower and the statement about the achievement of feeding the world in a sustainable way may need additional rigorous action as postulated in the Springman paper. Second, there is a growing danger to global food production. Specifically, crops and livestock are more shock prone than other such fisheries. <clears throat> excuse me, and aquaculture. And some regions such as South Asia are more frequently affected than others. What we need are coping strategies, for example, investing in climate smart food systems and building food reserves, especially for an important de import dependent nations, so they are better able to deal with these challenges.
What are the responsibility of policy in this context? Science has provided recommendations to policy and to society how to change towards sustainability. Some of the findings from science have been taken up in already existing policy documents. For example, in the Europe 2020 strategy, it states find new ways to reduce inputs, minimize waste, improve management and so on. Despite these ambitious policy goals, numbers tell us that we are failing to achieve these goals. While global population is increasing, a significant share of the world's population is suffering from undernutrition or malnutrition, while others, others waste food at outrageous numbers. In the EU alone, 88 million tons of food waste are generated annually with associated cost estimated at 143 billion euros. So as a response to this, some areas of action are identified by the policy to guide to move towards a more resource efficient and sustainable food system. You can see here on the right side, um, better techno uh, technical knowledge, um, stimulating sustainable food production and consumption, reducing food waste and improving food policy coherence. But what we need to ask is really how to start the implementation of this policy action and with whom to start these policy actions and what tools to use to get these action into practice. And that brings us to citizen science. Citizen science has to be promoted as a tool that brings together actors from science, society and policy. Specifically from environmental citizen science, we have learned that citizen science has manifold benefits for all involved. For example, spatial and temporal data collect collected by thousands of citizen scientists has generated, generated new information and knowledge and has greatly improved our understanding about biodiversity and the environment. This information is beneficial for the science actors, also for society. In the next 25 minutes, we are going to hear from our presenters about their current citizen science projects and how they link to citizen science, uh, to, to the SDGs. We will start with Jessica, followed by Rachel. After that, Ziri will present, followed by Danielle and Frederick will close the presenting session. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. And so I ask uh, Jessica to, to overtake the microphone and um, give us her talk. Thank you very much, Ina. And thank you very much for listening. Um, today, I'd like to present to you our concept on the topic, the impact of citizen science towards sustainable production of aromatic plants. Spices and herbs are examples of aromatic plants. And on the world market, they are grown largely in Asia, specifically in India and China. However, in other developing countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan, there's increased demand for the production of spices because it serves as a large um, factor when it comes to nation building in these countries. But lots of studies previously have looked at how crop productivity in terms of spices and herbs can be maximized by looking basically on issues such as labor and uh, marketing of quality spices as well as using improved technology. However, there is less of, um, comprehensive account on how sustainable agricultural practices like biodynamic agriculture, organic um, farming, as well as the use of indigenous agricultural techniques to improve crop productivity. Against this background, the main importance of our study is to find out how citizen science can be used as a tool to um, improve um, sustainable production of spices and herbs in Bangladesh and also in Pakistan. And we would like to ad um, address two objectives to identify the indigenous agricultural practices and how it increases crop productivity. And also we like to see how sustainable citizen science can be used in spice and herbs production in smallholder farmers. 
And to achieve this, we, we aim to uh, approach our study using a qualitative research approach. And we would, first of all, would like to purposively sample some small farms in Bangladesh and also in Pakistan, so that we will interact with farmers there and find out what kind or what types or the different kinds of indigenous agricultural processes that they apply and implement to boost their crop productivity. Also, we would like to um, engage with other smallholder farmers in, the, um, in, in this area so that we will get hold of all the indigenous practices that they have been using. And we, we aim to achieve um, some results. And this is to improve crop productivity by the adoption of organic farming and also by the adoption of biodynamic practices. Next slide, please. It seems I've skipped. I'm talking fast. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So these are the expected outcome of our study to improve crop productivity by adopting indigenous agricultural practices and also by adopting biodynamic agriculture and organic farming as well. And we would also like to see the impact of agricultural citizen science towards a study of spice and hair production. But however, we emphasize some constraints in carrying out our study. Because of the COVID-19, we emphasize that there might be less farming activities. This means that we might be restricted when it comes to the number of farmers that we will have contact with so that we'll be able to interact with them and find out what kind of indigenous agricultural practices that they are using. We also envisage that there'll be lack of incentives because, because of the pandemic, some of the farmers might be afraid to even engage with us because they might face the risk of maybe contracting this disease. But we believe that if there are some incentives, the farmers will be motivated to um, engage in our project. And also we have some limitation when it comes to the availability of the experts in the field of citizen science, because this is like a new form of methodology that a lot of people don't know about when we come to the global south. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, does it? Oh, okay. Yeah, next slide. So in conclusion, we would like to appeal to the EU policymakers to highlight the importance of citizen science as a tool for sustainable agricultural production and also to help us by giving incentives to smallholder farmers who would like to use indigenous agricultural practices. And in all, we would like to acknowledge that our study, if carried out successfully, will address five of the SDG goals, which is the goal one, which is no poverty, the goal three, which is responsible consumption, and the goal four, which is quality education, as well as um, the goal 12 and goal 15. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, the next is Rachel. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. You can hear me okay? Yes. Great. So, um, as has been discussed already, we know that food loss and food waste represent huge environmental, social and economic problems. Food waste highlights inequities in our food system. One third of food never reaches a human stomach due to food loss and waste. And this occurs at the same time as food insecurity, as well as overconsumption, which is seen by many as a form of waste and inefficiency. Agri and aquacultural expansion into new areas are, are a major cause of biodiversity loss. And according to the UN, if food waste were a country, it would be the third biggest global greenhouse gas emitter. Food waste and loss also present significant economic costs to producers, processors, retailers and households, as well as costs associated with collecting, managing and treating waste. Tackling food loss and waste has been recognised as an urgent task and SDG 12.3 aims to halve per capita food waste at retail and consumer levels by 2030, as well as reduce losses along production and supply chains. So myself and my co-authors, who you will see listed on the slide there, um, have carried out a study where we've examined opportunities for citizen science in the field of food loss and waste. And to do this, we used a list of priority research questions for the field of food loss and waste, which were developed in a process led by one of the co-authors here, Christian Reynolds. 
And this process followed a priority question iterative development methodology, um, which you may have seen used in um, many other fields by now. It was originally developed by Bill Sutherland in Cambridge for looking at um, conservation priorities. So that process was applied here. And the first step was to send out a questionnaire to experts in the field of food loss and waste consisting of government employees, consultants, charities, researchers, etc. And 92 people responded to that and submitted a total of 395 questions that they wanted to see research in this field address. Um, and that list of um, questions was narrowed down to a final list of 26 at an iterative sorting workshop with experts again in the field of food loss and waste. So what we did for this study was we took those questions and we used them as a basis to look for opportunities for um, citizen science. And we grouped them into two broad themes. The first one around quantifying and understanding food loss and waste, which made up 10 questions. And the second around interventions for reducing food loss and waste, which uh, made up the remainder. And um, to me, actually, that's really synonymous with, with a theme that's been echoed throughout this conference, which is that um, citizen science has the potential not only to um, monitor a problem, but also help to um, find solutions and actually make progress towards tackling those problems. So within these two broad themes, we explored where we felt citizen science approaches could help contribute to answering these priority questions. And just to give you a flavour of the things that we kind of um, delved into, we felt that there were opportunities for citizen science to fill some major data gaps. So that could include documentation of food waste by consumers, not only at the household level, but also, for example, in catering outlets or supermarkets. And that data could potentially be uploaded to an open platform to generate a better overall picture of the problem. We identified opportunities for quantifying food loss at the, at the production stage, for example, via farm extension workers or farmers themselves, or potentially even members of the public going into those settings and doing some monitoring. Um, we felt that citizen science approaches were particularly beneficial because by working closely with different actors, there's the potential to not only quantify a problem, but also understand the root causes of those problems, for example, the drivers that lead to food loss and waste, rather than just measuring the problem. And we felt that citizen science has been demonstrated to be a useful approach to develop partnerships. And we felt that bringing together actors from different stages in the food system um, in projects could help to understand how in interconnections between different stages in the food system could influence food loss and waste at other stages. So as well as that kind of quantification and understanding of the problem, we also identified opportunities for citizen science to understand interventions that could help reduce food loss and waste. And that could include the co-design and testing of food waste intervention, intervention strategies and communicating about project findings to wide audiences. Field trials with farmers of different crops, storage options, et cetera, et cetera and with other actors about packaging, distribution, marketing. Um, we thought there were opportunities for crowdsourcing, valorization and redistribution initiatives and mapping these. And crucially, we also saw citizen science as an intervention in itself as, particip as participation in these activities has the potential to raise awareness of problems and change participants' behavior. So as well as these opportunities in our study, we also identified some important challenges that need to be overcome if um, these opportunities are to be realized. And they're kind of common problems that we also see in um, citizen science as a whole. So, for example, around representativeness of participants and how do we ensure that, for example, household monitoring exercises, uh, uh, collecting data from a, a population that's representative of the wider population and therefore accurately representing the problem. How can small in-depth projects be scaled up to provide usable data and solutions at a national and international level? How can we reach beyond con consumer participants to other actors in the food system? And that will require different networks being formed, for example, with businesses across the supply chain. And, um, and we came up, you know, again, with the theme of really needing to embed evaluation within all projects so their efficacy can be 
documented and shared, as well as challenges and lessons learned so that the field can really evolve. Um, so overall, I think as part of this project, really, we wanted to, to show that citizen science really in this field has not been used that widely to date. Um, and we hope to kind of provide some inspiration to those considering using these approaches, as well as a ra uh, um, raising awareness of some of the challenges that will need to be overcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for this interesting talk. And the next is Ziri. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, let me see. Here we have it. It's a far too small for you to see, probably, but I'll try to explain what it's all about. Um, so it's a. This is a presentation of a very much a work in progress. Uh, it's a paper aiming to describe some limitations and possibilities when it comes to using surveys as a way to include citizens' values, citizens' views as a basis for normative evaluation of technology. Um, the technologies in question are specifically novel forms of genome editing uh, and the potential disruptive effects that such technologies may have when it comes to uh, producing uh, agri and agriculture products with enhanced qualities, which it could of course, is often presented as a potentially important part of, of the strategy towards a more sustainable food production. Uh, but as of today, no genetically modified products or, or uh, processes are approved uh, in, in the Norwegian market. So this paper is, is prepared as part of a project uh, that is um, uh, financed by the Norwegian Research Council, which looks into the ethical acceptability of the use of CRISPR technology in Atlantic salmon aquaculture. So this is the framing of it. And in the paper, we argue that it's important to include non-safety assessment of such biotechnological uh, innovations. And this is actually also mandatory as per the Norwegian Biotechnology Act. Uh, in other words, it's not only important to protect end users from potential harm or risk uh, resulting from such innovation, even in the cases where it can be shown that scientifically speaking the such small such, such risks are small or non-existent uh, there are still important value discussions to be had and some and these also uh, have have to do with our view of sustainability and sustainable development and and the balance between these different uh, sustainable development goals um, okay so uh, the Norwegian Biotechnology Act states that for a practice or a product to be uh, ethically sound, it must be in line with the values of society. And such values can, of course, to some extent be extracted from the laws and regulations in question. You can look at the programs of political parties or um, the, the civil society organizations, but we could also simply ask people about their attitudes and values. And this is often done, and the emphasis we see in Horizon Europe on citizen participation in science speaks for uh, to p having people to a much larger extent drawn into these processes uh, and one much used way uh, traditionally to do this is through surveys other ways could be through focus group interviews dialogues consultations and other engagement methods and these are also of course often used in 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 combination now, this paper we, we take as point of departure to quite recent Norwegian surveys focusing on their similarities and differences. And the intention of both of these surveys was to identify changes or potential changes in the attitudes towards the use of genome editing in animals and plants to be used within agri and aquaculture in light of all these new technologies uh, coming up. Uh, one, of the, one of the surveys used future possible cases as example. Uh, while the other used present present cases from abroad, specifically the U.S. market, and those two ways of doing it each come with their own challenges. One maybe being too hypothetical, uh, looking into the crystal ball of the future, and not sort of maybe connecting to people's values here and now, and the other one maybe not being too relevant in another way because the, after all the U.S. agricultural market is so different from from the Norwegian much more small scale. Uh, based form of, of agriculture. Uh, and in our view, both of these surveys fall short when it comes to providing a normative basis for non-safety assessment and really supporting any kind of, it, it's, it's hard to extract any view of what what the, what people actually think about uh, or what they, if, if, if their views are changing because 
The conclusions and suggestions drawn from them point in quite different direction, and it seems to more reflect the framing of the survey and the way the questions are asked. Uh, and uh, yeah, also the way these questions are framed seems to be rather uninformed by normative research. Uh, so the plan for the paper, um, where we are not quite there yet, is to discuss further uh, uh, in, in connection with normative theory how such shortcomings can be amended for by enhancing the research-based framing for such processes working both ways as citizen uh, engagement processes should do. It should inform citizens and citizens should inform the research. Uh, so a challenge here is to, to try to strike the right balance. Avoid giving too much information, too much context in advance, both for the risk of paternalism, sort of telling people what they should think, uh, how to avoid uh, value-laden questions, how to avoid that it becomes uh, just simply too demanding to take to take part just simply receiving all the context that you need to make up your mind is just too exhausting. So it's always a balance between too much and too little. Um, the point uh, we want to make is that in highly contested areas of research, such as, for example, genome editing in agri and aquaculture, citizen engagement approaches are important and have an important role to play because people's values are an important uh, measure of whether these technologies should be implemented. Uh, but in order for these to be legitimate, they should be knowledge-based, they should be based in transparent scientific and normative analysis. Uh, and one, I just might add as a, as a final point that a critical aspect of citizen engagement, the way it's promoted in the drafts of Horizon Europe that I've seen so far, is maybe a lack of emphasis on such normative analysis, risking that citizen engagement becomes about increasing the legitimacy and the way forward for technologies rather than actually listening into what are the people, what are the values that we want to align these technologies with. Thank you. Thank you, Ziri. That was very interesting. The next is Danielle. Um, I switched on the, the slide. Okay, so we know we need to change how we eat, but doing so, it, it isn't straightforward. Food practices are situated in the body, in the family, in the home, in social groups, in culture and tradition, and they're impacted by local conditions. Food system transformation needs to be systemic, but also relevant to situated everyday practices, coherent with available possibilities, able to fulfill deep-seated sociocultural as well as nutritional needs. So Rethinking Food takes the Future 50 Foods report, which is financed by the World Wildlife Federation and Knorr Food, as a starting point to think about how families in Denmark can transform how they eat to be more sustainable. Now, this report is usefully troubling. It's authored by world-leading food and sustainability experts, but the unlikely coupling of Knorr with sustainability raises many questions for people. Not all of the foods are available everywhere. A common complaint that we get from participants is why Japanese mushrooms and not the ones we can forage locally? And what are bambara nuts? Why would eating foods from Africa or Asia or South America be more sustainable? Next slide, please. The study has three courses. Um, first is the main course, which involves 35 families from Colling in Denmark. Kolling has a population of 90,000 people. It's a small city with surrounding villages. The second course is free range and involves households of any description from all over Denmark. It hasn't started yet. We're partnered with the Danish National Broadcaster on this course and hope to have upwards of 100,000 participants based on previous citizen science partnerships that they've done. The third course is dessert, and this is where we all come together for community analysis and peer review. The different courses let us look at different things. The influence of children on sustainability choices, changes in experience and position from one geographic location to another, and the impact and possibilities of conducting food-based research online. So in the main course, the families meet the researchers, they receive a box of locally purchased Future 50 foods, they're currently sharing recipes and impressions and having discussions on a closed Facebook group where they can also speak with us, the researchers, and an award-winning local chef. In the next month, the chef will lead two online cooking sessions with them. In the first, everyone cooks Christopher's menu and he talks about how he feeds his family, two adults and two small kids 
with minimum time, minimum money, maximum diversity, and maximum health benefit for people and planet. In the second online cooking session, the families cook whatever they want for dinner and they continue the discussion with Christopher while he cooks for his family in parallel. At the end of November, we all come together for community analysis and peer review, and this is where we prototype what we'll do in January for dessert. So following this, the main course participants can join the free range study and or just drop in for dessert in January. For the free range course, these households don't receive a food pack and much of their participation is self-directed following prompts from the research team delivered through an online portal and a closed Facebook group. So participants will have access to lots of supplementary material, expert interviews and related interest stories provided by the national broadcaster and materials drip fed to the Facebook group from the main course with the permission and input of main course participants. In free range, Christopher holds a third online cooking session accessible to everyone. And this is where we cook together, share ideas inspired by the Future 50 Foods, think about food and sustainability agendas more broadly, and the importance of commensality, the social value of eating together. Whether your grandmother is in Malmö in Sweden, your parents or in-laws are in Turkey, or the older children live now in another city or town, how do we eat together today and maintain what's important? Dessert is pretty straightforward. It's community-based analysis. Can Please stop the alarm, Annette. Can, can, can you stop? Thank you. So dessert is pretty straightforward, community-based analysis and peer review. The aim here is to challenge and develop the researchers' findings and ensure we're representing our participants' experiences and views. And I'll take a few seconds longer. Eating is personal. It's political. It's a locally situated, globally impactful everyday activity. Our participants so far have been open-minded about transforming their eating behaviours. They're willing to compromise on taste and flavour for more sustainability, however time and cost exert very real pressures, and children's willingness to experiment can also be an issue. Our main course participants are predominantly middle-class Danish families, but not all of them are. And while we would have liked more diversity, we hope to expand through the free range course. We also recognise that middle-class Danes are by far the most dominant demographic in Denmark, so if they can change how they eat and the demands they're making on the local food system begin to reflect those changes, it will hopefully make eating more sustainable, more sustainable and more accessible for others. So this project is part of a larger research program that looks at food as a vital catalyst for societal transformation. In January, we start a four-year EU project that turns Colling Municipality, along with 11 other European cities, into food living labs. And we'll try to go further in understanding how to move from behaviour change to culture change, using participatory approaches to research through design to enliven how we enact citizen science by moving, making, doing, eating, sharing, conducting community-based analysis and peer review. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. I think I had a third slide, but... No, oh, I forgot to ask you to change through to it. Sorry, the okay. alarm was going off. Yeah, sorry for that. Um, yeah. Okay, and uh, staying at the same issue and uh, asking Frederick now, that's your floor. Thank you very much, Ina. So, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. So, I, I know the poster will be too small for you to see, but please get in touch if you would like it uh, emailed to you. So, um, hello everyone. I'm, my name is Fredrik Bronius. I'm a researcher and press officer at the Swedish non profit organization VA, Public and Science. And I'm giving this presentation instead of Roberto Rufo Gonzalez, who unfortunately couldn't join the conference today. Uh, so the food waste experiment. Um, every year since 2009, we at VA coordinate a national citizen science project for schools as part of the Swedish events on the European Researchers Night. And this year's project is focused on food waste and will take place during the three weeks in November. And uh, here we are collaborating with researchers from the KTH Royal Institute of Technology, uh, Dalarna University, and the company Consupedia. And hopefully, lots of teachers and thousands of pupils from all over Sweden. Uh, the technological basis of the experiment is that the researchers in the consortium 
have created the world's uh, largest database on sustainability factors related to food with regard to climate and environmental impact, health uh, and justice fairness in the production process. And this database was developed over a period about five years with an aim to uh, foster sustainable food consumption. And to gather the information for the database, they are using a bot, um, that's to say a computer program that they originally developed to find and process information to automatically publish articles on Wikipedia, and uh, which has actually published millions of articles on Wikipedia to date. But for the food database, the bot was instead programmed to retrieve sustainability data on thousands and thousands of food products. And currently, uh, the database contains more than 200,000 200, products and uh, more are being added, uh, being added all the time. And currently, uh, anyone can use the, the, the cell phone app that is uh, connected to the database and scan barcodes in Swedish supermarkets to immediately get sustainability information and compare different food products with each other. But for the food waste experiment, the researchers have developed another mobile phone feature which connects their sustainability database to an artificial intelligence uh, designed to identify and quantify different kinds of food. So the idea is when you take a picture of a plate of food, the app will instantly let you know the climate impact of this food. But in order to do that, the artificial intelligence needs to be educated or trained uh, on heaps of different kinds of food. And this is where the teachers and the pupils come in, in our uh, citizen science initiative. Uh, their first task will be to photograph their lunch plates and also indicate what kinds of food are on the plates. For instance, um, meatballs, potatoes and broccoli. And then the artificial intelligence will in real time uh, develop its abilities to recognize these kinds of food. So this will be the first week of three uh, in the experiment to collect and name lots and lots of images of lunch plates to train the artificial intelligence. And the following two weeks, the pupils will use the app to measure the climate impact of their food waste. So during this time, they will scan their plates before and after they have eaten, and the app will then calculate the climate impact of the food being wasted. And before lunch, the app will give them information uh, on the carbon footprint of the different dishes that are on the main on the menu that day and we are not going to con, um, collect any personal data uh, all food waste data will be on an aggregated class level and during the experiment the pupils and teachers will be able to compare their food waste to the average food waste of all other participating classes In this way we are hoping to find out what which kinds of food and which kinds of food combinations generate the most waste and where the more and better information and feedback can foster um, virtuous circles in how food is being handled. So thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, now I will switch off the screen. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you all for this very insightful talks. Um, because we have only some minutes left, I will immediately start with the Q&A. So you, the audience, the participants out there, you have now the possibility to use the chat function uh, to ask questions or to com comment the talks. Um, please do not forget to address uh, the presenter. So ask, for example, at Frederick or at Danielle, so that uh, then I will, will pick up the question and um, give it to the presenters. Okay, up to now there, there's no question. Um, I have a first question to Friedrich. Um, 
yeah, thank you for for this interesting project. Um, for my experiences in, in Germany, it's not so easy to bring the managers of canteens uh, or the guests to change uh, the dishes or the eating ex uh, expectations. Um, do you plan to involve canteen managers or chiefs in your study? Yes, they are actually involved. We have a couple of focus schools where the kitchen managers are involved in both uh, creating developing the, the project as such, but also in getting the artificial intelligence started by taking pictures of different kinds of food that they are serving. And I think in Sweden currently, there is quite a push for more sustainability when it comes to um, the, the food in, in schools particularly. Um, thank you. Here I have a comment of Naomi. She uh, writes, maybe this application can be even used in the future food project. Uh, maybe this is also a comment to Frederick, I think. Sure, why not? I mean, the, the only limitation is what, what, uh, what the, the food that's in the database. Currently, the, the database is uh, based on Swedish food, the articles that are available in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So you would need to ask the bot to collect um, food mm -hmm. data or sustainability data from other, other uh, countries, the foods that are on sale there. So it's not only able to recognize meatballs, but also other forms of food. No. Right. <laughs> you can train it to recognize anything. <laughs> so maybe, uh, I prepared some other question, but maybe some of the other presenters uh, want to ask uh, Friedrich or Danielle. Um, I think some of your projects are similar or uh, can uh, connect with each other. No, then I have one question to Jessica. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Uh, you told me in, in before the session that uh, the concept uh, or the, uh, the research project uh, you introduced to us, it's something like a concept. Um, do you plan to implement a specific approach that allows other farmers to apply the indigenous knowledge or sustainable production of spices? Yes, so one of the incentives that we have in mind to get the farmers on board is to motivate them by giving them some varieties of seeds, of spices, that they can use their own indigenous agricultural practices to cultivate them. And by doing that, I, I know that it's, it will be a bit difficult because this indigenous agricultural practice that they have is like their own property, is their own like um family property and they won't like to share with others like us who are scientists so what we would like to do to motivate them to gain this knowledge is by also giving them some practical experiences when it comes to improve their cultural practices for example like the use of um, organic farming practices so this is what we would like to exchange to get a feel of their indigenous agricultural practices Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think, oh, okay, Danielle, yes. Uh, you're muted, I think. Thank you. I have a follow-up question for, for Jessica. I, I okay. noted this down when you were talking as well. Mm -hmm. I was very curious about the ethics of using incentives for participation, and you just spoke then about exchange. I wonder, do, do you discuss the ethics of it as an ethics of participation with the participants do do um, do you do you tackle it head on or mm -hmm. do you just enact what you believe are ethical ways of enacting of in, in, in incentivizing participation um thanks for this question yeah i didn't think about it in that way but i think we would go about it the ethical way because as you already know, it's their knowledge. And I mean, giving them incentives like improved seeds variety is not enough, but we should we will go the right way by looking at maybe some um, governmental structures that is in place to see how we can get this information with them. But from I, them, sorry. 
That that sounds great, but I wonder what might come of actually sitting down and discussing with them the ethics of what you're doing, like acknowledging we know these are your practices. Mm-hmm. With we have been thinking about it in this way, but but how are you thinking about it? What what for you is is going on here that would be interesting that you actually engage them collaboratively in decision making around Mm -hmm. what the best way to handle it would be because their perspectives may may diverge considerably from your own um okay so one thing that we would like to also do is to involve like um people in the ministry of um, agriculture in these in these countries and to get them to know about, I mean, the impact of this indigenous knowledge from farmers in their countries, and also to come up with like a document in in the form of, let's say, um, um, a compilation of all the information that we get from the farmers and then share with the Ministry of Agriculture in these countries. So it's like, in a way, we won't kind of have a lot of issues when it comes to ethical stuff, but then we will involve the government I don't know if I have answered your question, but this is I, something I was, that I would I like actually, to do. I was actually a lot of, uh, okay. I was proposing something a little bit different that you do a kind of collaborative, okay. in the spirit of citizen science, that you uh-huh. collaborate with the farmers to be able to have the conversations that are needed to understand what, in their opinion, okay. would would be the best thing to do because we come with certain knowledges, and our uh-huh. knowledges may not align. Uh, easily with the knowledges that 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 they bring and the perspectives that they bring, and so I'm curious about actually having those conversations with them rather than doing a kind of top down, deciding that the top down position is the is the best decision. Actually, just saying, look, we can see that there are potential issues here. Mm-hmm. We would like to have a, a discussion around it with you and together, okay, work out what might happen. I mean, it's, it seems to be kind of in the spirit of citizen science to do that, to involve the citizens in the in the decision making. Okay, okay. Th- thank Thanks you. For the suggestion. Yeah, I, I, I think this uh, is a very uh, good hint for you, Jessica, in uh, uh, designing your project, uh, because it, um, uh, it's similar to that, uh, what Rachel uh, tells us in her talk. Um, I have here one hint uh, by Katrin Radesch. She uh, in, recommends you a German initiative about patent-free seeds. Uh, maybe you can get in touch about this um, for your project. Now we have only some seconds. I will conclude our food session. We had a very uh, various um, issues, very interesting uh, and very diverse talks about responsible food consumption and production through citizen science. And I would like to make three points to conclude. Um, And the first one is uh, what I have learned uh, that the human food system impacts all 17 SDGs in an interconnected way. Annette had, has explained it in her keynote, and uh, we saw it on the posters and slides of the presenters, the different SDGs they are addressed. From that, one conclude. Someone is typing. It's, uh, oh, sorry, that's me. <laughs> um, from that, one can conclu- conclude that food might be an important cross cutting issue to address the SDGs politically and uh, socially. This is a huge opportunity, but it's also a big challenge, I think. For us as designers of citizen science projects, it might be important to focus on one specific development. A sustainable development goal to provide specific data and to push learning processes regarding a specific pathway towards sustainable development. Otherwise, this cross-cutting issue of food threatens to become a barity. The second point I want to make is um, citizen science is a promising approach. We learned it um, at the conference and we all know this. Um, We learned here in the session about different approaches to involve stakeholders to to generate or conserve 
data and knowledge and we learned about contributory projects at the food weight experiment and uh, the relevance of co-creation um, in citizen science projects, different societal groups are involved and certainly it seems that the group of decision makers often is missing. So we as citizen scientists hope that policy makers will receive, understand and implement the results of our research. Maybe in some cases we should reconsider the role of policy. In some cases it might be an interesting approach to involve decision makers into the citizen science process and doing this citizen science includes their perspectives and open up direct channels to the policy level. And the third point is uh, addressing the SDGs better in this session. We worked out some wishes to policymakers, for example, providing access to related data and information or creating various tools of uh, incenting, incentives and funding. These and other recommendations you can find also in the declaration of the conference. It includes a guide for action by defining roles, contributions and concrete potentials of citizen science to advance its SDGs. And we would like to ask you to sign the declaration, becoming a strong contract at the beginning of the European Decade of Citizen Science. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. <laughs> I think it was very Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.